Hey everyone, today is a very exciting day because I've been waiting for a seven frame apame to come in the mail and it is finally here. Casey has absolutely loved apames. We have so many in our entire operation. So I thought that this would be a great time to break down what we use apame for, what we think about, what we truly, truly think about apames. And hopefully this can help you decide if an apame is actually worth it. All right, so this is Apame's seven frame hive. And before I get into talking about how Casey loves to use this hive in particular and how he's used it for many stress tests, let me introduce you to this hive in particular first. So honestly, this hive is designed to make life easier. Whether you're brand new to bees or even keeping them for years, the first thing that I have always loved about all Apame's, like hands down, is that it comes fully assembled and I don't have to paint it. I don't have to spend an entire weekend in the garage spraying them or painting them by hand in order to get them ready for the elements. You can literally just pull them out of the box and start using them as is. And opening it up, inspecting, feeding, and even moving it around is all super, super simple. Apame has these handles on the side of the box, so you can just kind of strap things down with their little like buckle clamps and pick it up and move them wherever you want to put them. But the reason why Casey and I have always been drawn to them is that the biggest thing about them is that they have insulation. We live in Michigan, so insulation can sometimes help with our hives, but generally we have just overwintered our hives all in wooden boxes. But when it comes to some of the experiments that Casey likes to run, he really likes putting them in these with that extra insulation just to kind of help buffer some of the extreme stress tests that he puts them in. So these hives, they're truly built to handle really extreme weather. So that means they'll have less condensation and moisture built up inside because they're able to be ventilated easier. They actually have a screened bottom board. This can help with varroa mites, also helps with small hive beetles, and it helps with that extra ventilation. Moisture is one of the biggest killers of honeybee colonies in the winter, but it does actually come with a tray if you don't want to keep that screened bottom board open as well. And the apames all come with some really thought out standard features. Like I said, that screen bottom board is great for mic control, a split entrance with reducers, a division board if you ever want to split a colony in half or just remove a frame from them and start your own brand new colony. And there's even two top feeders, one for each side if you are running it as a split. And that's maybe my favorite part about this is that you can run this as one seven frame or you can divide it into two three frame hives with a board in between in the middle. So if you want to use this as a mating nuke, you can also do that. Honestly, this hive has so much versatility that you could do anything with this hive. If it was the end of the world and I had to pick one piece of equipment that I needed to have in order to be a beekeeper, this would be the hive I would honestly pick. I can use a stick as a hive tool. But when it comes to this hive, you can do anything with it. Now, let me tell you why not only me, but Casey loves using these hives for his queen breeding operation so, so much. First off, We've got at least 10 of the 10 frame Apame hives, and that's not even counting the extra boxes that we stack on top to make them into double deeps. When he first started keeping bees, he went all in on Apame and bought a ton of their equipment. I will be honest, they are a little on the pricey side, but the features really make it worth it. And also, as their operation has grown from more of a hobby to a sideline and now leaning more towards commercial, we started phasing out some of the equipment that we don't really use anymore that maybe we kind of leaned on when we were only doing this as a hobby. But these Apames, they're not going anywhere. And here's why. So Casey, he loves being able to pull one of these boxes head to one of our strong yards and shake a ton of bees along with some brood and a little bit of honey and resources and instantly build a grafting hive or 
really is called a cell builder. Caseus always calls it a grafting hive, so yeah. But he then brings that box home so the bees do not drift back to their original hives. And from there, he just drops in his freshly grafted larva and they take to it fast because they've got nowhere else to go. And the best part, these hives don't let a single bee escape. They close up tight, strap down securely, and that makes them a perfect travel companion. Honestly, they became a sidekick in queen rearing. And to give you a little more backstory, for the last seven years, Casey has been putting his bees through multiple different stress tests, all with the goal of breeding a queen that we have today. It took him five years to develop our main breeder queen, Viplidu. He did it by never feeding and never treating for mites, which is kind of why to this day he still laughs that he barely knows how to treat for mites. But all of that stress testing shaped his lines and it's one of the reasons these highs play such a key role in what we're doing right now. So the hive that I'm going through right now is actually one of Casey, Casey's breeder queen, Vipladu. It's one of her daughters, and he ended up naming her Nepo. So let me give you a backstory on where this hive has been because it's actually kind of wild what he's done with this hive. So last year, this colony started out as just a three-frame split. We gave them a queen cell from our main breeder queen, and by July... They had built all the way up to a 7 over 7 over 7 setup, so 21 frames total. Then Casey took off the top two boxes as splits, gave each one of those a queens, and all three hives went side by side into their first real test, his overwintering test. Also, I should mention that he did also kind of do a test on those hives because bringing the hives to our porch and moving them in that kind of state in July put its own sort of test on them too because hey, now they can be moved and they're not just gonna completely collapse. Um, so yeah, I thought that was kinda neat. Now, here's how he does these tests. He calls them neglect tests. That means no treatment for mites, no feeding, no extra management. He basically puts them in a box and says, figure it out and if you make it to spring, then we'll have fun. <laughs> So these hives weren't even given emergency feed. They actually went into winter with only seven frames each. And after winter, well, there was only one hive standing and that was Nepo. So since then, Casey added a box and a few more frames. As you can tell, she now has a second box of seven frames on top of her. But other than that, he hasn't touched them at all. So no treatments, no feed, no moving frames around. He hasn't even given them more space than that top box. And you know what? They haven't even swarmed once this year. So from what I can see, they've got about six frames of honey stored and the queen has started to slow down her laying, which means she is truly working off of the local environment and not artificial feed. One more thing to point out, all of those three overwintered hives that he sent through the winter through their test all had an open screen bottom board. This one included. And remember, we're in Michigan. That's a cold climate. So what I'm noticing is they're really not working the bottom part of the frames in the bottom box. Maybe about a fourth of it is not being used, which is pretty typical in colder weather. It's actually gotten pretty cold here pretty early. We've had some Indian summers over the last couple years, but we've actually been having some 50 degree days over the last couple days. Um, so yeah, fall came pretty fast. But the bees will move up to conserve heat, and right now it looks like we've got a 3 over 3 patch of brood with a 3 over 3 block of honey right next to it. It almost looks like they're planning to move over to the left for this winter time. So, this year's test for Nepo is once again the neglect test. Can we put bees in a box and leave them completely alone, and will they still be here next spring? The whole point is we don't want bees that need to be babied 24 seven. If we have to constantly dump feed on them and treat them over and over, those aren't really efficient bees. So Casey's goal is to keep working towards bees that are naturally mite resistant and can manage Roa on their own. 
in a commercial operation, I honestly kind of think that we're probably going to always have to need some level of treatment. But if we could treat less often, that would be a game changer. It would mean fewer losses like we saw in the big honeybee die off this year in 2025. The other side of this is nutrition. We're living in a time when bees just don't have the forage that they used to. That's why one of the traits that we look for in our bees is that they don't blow through all of their stores like crazy. Bees that know how to conserve and especially bees that know how to store excess pollen. That's one of the strongest traits that we've seen in our main breeder queen, Vipladu, and that's exactly why Casey runs these stress tests. He's looking for bees that can survive on their own, store what they need, and still build up strong year after year. So this hive right here is a Hawaiian queen that we decided to try out this year just to see how she would do. So back in May, Casey put her in this apame on our porch with three frames of bees, some brood, and all drawn comb so that he could watch her very closely. And honestly, she looks fabulous right now. Her brood pattern is super solid, but here's the thing. She's been slow to build up all year and as I'm going through her I'm starting to wonder if maybe she's just on a totally different rhythm because of where she came from like maybe she's still tuned into that Hawaiian timing you know because her brood looks great but she has zero food in this box and at this point in the season that is a huge problem so unless I feed her heavily, there's just no way she'd make it through a Michigan winter, especially since goldenrod isn't something you can necessarily count on. But also, like I said, she really hasn't built up all year. She's just stayed in this single box. Now, she is one of the Hawaiian VSH breeders, so we haven't treated her for mites at all this year. But because she struggled to build up on the timeline we usually like to see, Casey decided that she's not going to stay in our breeding program. Instead, we're going to move her into a standard box on one of the pallets that we'll be sending to California. I'm also giving her some extra bees from a hive that tried to make a queen in September, which let's be honest, that is way too late here. So I'm combining them, I'm going to feed them heavy and get them ready to ship in December. One of the biggest things Casey looks for in breeder queens is their ability to build up quickly. Here in Michigan, we've only got a short window for our bees to truly perform. And if they take all summer to hit their stride, you've basically lost the whole year. That's why we absolutely love Vipladu's genetics so much. She pushes herself to the absolute limit, laying sheets and sheets of eggs, even if she barely has the bees to cover them. That drive to build fast is exactly what we're looking for because in this climate, timing is everything. So when I first opened these hives today, I started with curiosity. And I wanted to see how different queens, different genetics, and different management styles would hold up when put to the test. And along the way of our entire beekeeping journey so far, we have seen hives that have thrived, hives that have struggled, and hives that outright surprise us. Every single one has told its own story. And you know, that's the beauty of beekeeping. It actually mirrors life. Not every queen will be a champion, not every colony will make it through winter, but the ones that do, the ones that push through the cold, the mites, Casey's stress tests, and still come out stronger on the other side, those are the ones that carry us forward. Casey has spent years putting his bees through trials, never babing them, never lowering the bar, because he knows the bees that emerge from that fire are the bees worth keeping. And in a way, that's the same challenge that we face as people. The tests, the struggles, the setbacks, they aren't there to stop us. They're actually there to shape us. And I think that is the biggest thing that I have learned this year in trying to grow our operation to an ability to send 200 hives to almond pollination. So as I close out this video, I want you to take this with you. 
Resilience is built in the hardest seasons, whether it's a hive proving it can survive without hands holding, or you chasing after a dream that feels too far out of reach. Every step you take under pressure is making you stronger. These bees are writing their own story of survival and in the process, they're helping us write our own. And if they can do it, tiny creatures fighting against the odds, then so can you. So I will leave you with that. As always, thank you for following along on this journey. Thank you for all of the support that you have sent our way. And my heart pours out to you. Also, my heart pours out to the family of Charlie Kirk in the recent tragedy that has happened. And yeah, I guess that is it. I'll see you guys in the next one. Don't forget, don't quit and be fit. And honey is just a product until you meet the beekeeper behind it. See you guys.